Chapter 3 La Estrella When we got back to the river's edge, the girls exhausted themselves prepping the body for the trip. Vele held a flashlight while Juanita, who had bought a pair of Papa's old jeans, one of his dress shirts, and his cowboy boots, dressed the body with the reverence of a dedicated mortician. Afterward, we slept with the mariposas in the car. At five o'clock in the morning, the girls got up and splashed cold water on their faces. I don't like it, Vita scrunched her chubby face in disgust when they propped the dressed body up against the mesquite's trunk. He was as rigid as the mannequins at J.C. Penney, with a baseball cap on his head, dim sunglasses over his lifeless eyes, and his arms crossed awkwardly in front of him. He looks too much like Papa, Delia admitted, stepping away from him. Belia scrubbed away the thick layer of rogue, of rogue Juanita had applied to his cheekbones in the dark. He looks like a prostitute. He does not, Juanita said. Don't take it all off. He needs to look alive. Delia helped her twin scrub off the excess makeup from the dead man's neck. He doesn't look alive. He looks ridiculous. Men don't wear makeup, Juanita. Fine, have it your way. We're going to get caught if he doesn't look half alive, Juanita answered. I left them there arguing with each other and took a short walk while they figured things out. Once they got the body in the car, I'd drive us up to the international bridge and turn it in. We'd be home in time to fix breakfast for Mama. Then we'd go to bed and only dream about what could have happened after this night. I walked alone along the riverbank. In the dawning light, it shimmered with the hues of a day fighting away the shadows of night, while the multitude of trees and shrubbery that grew for miles and miles along the riverbank still shrouded the land in shadow. Suddenly, to the left of me, about ten yards southeast along the river beyond the twisted paths my sisters and I had worn into the thicket, two small figures ran past me, in and out of the dusty brush right up to the river's edge. They ran along the bank, skirting it so closely that pebbles flew off their footsteps and bounced down into the water. Their faces were indistinguishable in the dark, and their white outfits were muted by the lack of sunlight. But I could see that they were little boys, running away from something. Or someone. It didn't take very long to see who they were running from. Behind them, a woman in a pale dress came running, screaming at the boys, begging them to stop. Her long black hair whipped behind her as she fought through the brush. It was clear to me she was worried, frantic even, that they might fall into the river. Ay, mis hijos, she screamed as she sidestepped ruts and rocks with her small bare feet. The short trees tore at her immaculate white dress, but she didn't care. She pulled herself free of any tree limbs that clawed at her and kept chasing after her children, never losing sight of them. Hey, I screamed after the children. They didn't turn and look at me or acknowledge me in any way. They were getting dangerously close to the cliff at the edge of the river. I left the security of our path and darted after them. They still ran parallel to the waters of the Rio Grande, much too close to the current that roared furiously below. The waters here were dark and angry, almost violent. Nothing like our friendly swimming hole. I sped up, afraid they might lose their footing. Too late, I screamed for them to get away from the edge. In a second, they were falling, both of them one behind the other. Into the water they went, making loud splashes as they fought to stay afloat. Without thinking, I scrambled up to the edge and jumped in after them. The roar and chilliness of the dark water awakened my senses, and my heart constricted in my chest as they came up for air. I had to fight the undercurrent to keep from being swept away. As I struggled to stay afloat, I looked around wildly for the children, who I clearly saw fall into the water seconds before me. They were about 15 feet away from me, being dragged down into the body of a heavy current. Their mother, running along the river, cried and screamed for me to help them. I, mis hijos, she wailed miserably. I swam with long, even strokes, trying to remain in control of my body, not letting the undertow pull me down. But my efforts were in vain. The water rose over my head and swirled around me like a whirlpool dragging me deeper and deeper until the thin light of dawn turned into darkness and I couldn't see anything anymore. All was obscurity and cold, and I thought I would drown. What would Mama think? Did I fail my sisters? My lungs, my lungs ached with the pressure of unreleased air. Just when I was about to give in, the roaring stopped and I felt myself break through the surface. The fresh morning air hurt my lungs like a blow to the chest and I pressed a fist against my heart as it stopped the pain from killing me. As I coughed and sputtered in agony in the now calm water, I saw one of the boys floating before me. 
I grabbed his arm and pulled him in, dragging him over my shoulder. I began to swim toward the riverbank, where his mother was crying out for me to bring him to her. When I got close enough, she stepped back. You're too late. He drowned, she wailed, as she stood watching me struggle with her son's body. At her words, inexplicably, the boy's body slipped from me. It bobbed in the water and wavered in the pre-dawn light, then disappeared before my very eyes. I turned around to look for his, his brother and saw him drifting a few feet away from me. Before I could dive in for him, he vanished like a strange mirage. Here, let me help you, their mother said, extending her hand to me from above. The hand was cold as a corpse, but I took it anyway. At first I attributed the coldness to her state of despair, or my own soakedness. But when she pulled me out, she spoke again. And what she said, to me, and what she said made me want to jump right back in the water. It is always the same way, she said, her expression helpless in a worn and weary face. The woman's long hair was long and disheveled, and her long tunic dress was torn and frayed. I could tell it used to be a white robe of some kind when it was new, but it was so old it was gray now. On the whole, she looked unkempt and malnourished, close to death. They drown before I can reach them. It is my nightmare, my destiny, my fate to search endlessly for them by night, only to find them drown with the sigh of mourning. Recognition entered my mind, and I froze, unable to speak. The woman's eyes softened, and she looked sad. You know who I am, don't you? Yorona, I whispered, the dreadful name before I could censor myself. Most women would be offended to be mistaken for the ghostly apparition, but she did not flinch at the horrific namesake. Instead, her smile was apologetic and teary. It evoked compassion rather than fear. Some call me that, she admitted as she tried to take my hand. Don't be afraid. I can't harm you. Was she saying she was La Llorona? As much as the idea of talking to a ghost fascinated me, it also frightened me. I heard so many awful things about La Llorona, and I couldn't help it. I pulled away from her and took a few steps back. But you killed your children. It was common knowledge, more than a legend. Every mother on both sides of the border warns her children that La Llorona will get them if they wander too close to the river. I couldn't help but wonder if by playing in, in it all summer, we hadn't cursed ourselves. I know what they say, she admitted. I've heard the story so many times through the centuries. But they are mistaken. I did not drown my chiquitos. You didn't? Then why did you run? Well, then why did they run away from you? I looked back at the dark river, wondering if I had really seen her children drowning. Had I, had I imagined trying to save them? Was it possible I was dreaming all this? La Llorona stepped away from me and turned to the river. She wrapped her arms around herself, as if the memory gave her a chill. We were arguing that night. Their father, Hernan, and I, about his decision to leave. We fought over the children, dragged them into our pain. Mis hijos were so scared, so confused, that they fled toward the river in darkness and drowned. It is a nightmare I experience every night, a memory I am forever reliving. I went to stand beside her. Her loss was so unimaginable, and suddenly she was very human to me. Why do you look for them if you know they are dead? It is a punishment I impose on myself, La Llorona began, a penance for my part in it. I should have been more careful, make sure they were always safe. I want them to come back to me, but they won't, or can't. I don't know the reason behind it, but they are being kept from me. I would never take the children that play at the river the way people say I do. I don't want other children. They can never replace my chiquitos. Believe me, you and your sisters have nothing to worry about. I am not here to harm you. I considered her words and wondered why someone would willingly punish herself for all eternity. It seemed implausible to me. But then again, I was standing on the edge of a river talking to a ghost. Nothing was normal. Nothing made sense. Then what do you want from us? You were chosen for the goodness in your heart, she explained. Like Juan Diego, the most humble of the Virgen's children, you are noble and kind-hearted. You displayed great courage when you jumped into the water to save my sons. Your sister, your sister was right when she said finding the body of the drowned man was not an accident. She took my hand once again, her touch still deathly cold. Standing beside the hackberry shrubs, with hundreds of empty, desiccated cocoons still clinging to their branches and a, carp and a carpet of butterfly corpses under her feet, La Llorona did not look anything like a malevolent specter. She looked more like a tired, heavily burdened woman. 
My sisters are waiting, I said, trying to take my hands from her so that I might escape if I had to. La Llorona let go of my hand. Please, try to have faith. I'm here in your service to guide and protect you, she said. I put my hands under my arms to warm them. Protect me? From what? Yes, she said, a wry smile curling around her lips. She had a look of age about her, despite appearing no older than Mama. It was something in her eyes, the sorrow of long ages lived in them. It is an eternal atonement to watch over children of the sun, the children of my people, the Azteca bloodline. Aztec, I asked, surprised. Mama never said we were Aztec. Papa was fair-haired and light-complected, implying a Spanish bloodline rather than native Mexican. But Mama did, did have olive skin, black hair, and dark eyes. Yes. You are a descendant of a great people, she continued, pulling my attention away from the wild, erratic thoughts and making me focus on the situation at hand. At that very moment, the sun burst out from beneath the horizon, and La Llorona's features changed. She went from being a tired woman to looking downright frightening. Her disheveled hair suddenly turned completely white. The loose, silvery strands writhed around her head like serpentine ghosts, more fearsome than Medusa's. La Llorona's gaunt face shriveled up like a pale raisin, becoming shallow, sallow and ashen, creased by centuries of wrinkles and dark blotches. But it was her eyes that scared me the most. They turned a deep, evil black. They glittered like cursed gemstone. I was so terrified I couldn't move, but I trembled where I stood. I couldn't speak for a moment. My throat tightened and I was having trouble breathing. Don't be afraid, she pleaded. I don't have much time. Once the sun rises completely, I must go back. The gentleness of her voice calmed me a little, and I was able to reply, though I wanted to run away back to my hermanitas. G go back where? Why are you here? I have been sent here to help you find your way, La Llorona said. There is a path designed for everyone, and everyone must walk in his path or her path. This is your path. You must walk it. To refuse would be unfortunate. Unfortunate. The word, the word felt ominous, coming from La Llorona herself, and my body stiffened in response. I fought to speak, to get out the words to the question that was suddenly weighing heavily on my mind. Am I going to be cursed like, like you if I don't walk my path? Change must take place. It is important to remain as you are, as you are would lead to isolation. You would be doomed to a lonely existence, ripped apart from those you love. I threw up my arms and let out a frustrated sigh. You were speaking in riddles. I didn't understand what you, I didn't understand what La Llorona wanted me to do. How was I supposed to change, to find my way? What did that even mean? Then let me speak plainly, La Llorona began. You must go to El Sacrificio and take the drowned man back to his family. The sun had finished rising and its full radiance was dissolving La Llorona's form. She stooped to hide under the shade of a cluster of huisachi trees, looking almost translucent. But we don't even know who he is. Sure, we have his wallet, but we're just kids, I began. It's not all about him, La Llorona assured me. This is, about, this is about you and your loved ones, too. Your family is lost in turmoil. You must find each other, you must find each other, become whole again. Though La Llorona's body was translucent, her eyes remained untouched dark and luminous in the shadows of the Huisachi tree. Are you saying that this is about the trouble between Mama and Papa? This is about all of you, your sisters, your parents, even your abuela, La Llorona continued. You must travel to the other side, into the land of your ancestors to find each other again. Before I could ask her to clarify her puzzle, after all, my sisters are all right here with me. I heard Juanita's voice, then Delia and Velia calling out for me. I turned towards the clearing. Here, take this, La Llorona said, reaching for me again. This time I did not pull away as she placed something bulky and cold into the palm of my hand, and it closed it tightly for me, her bony fingers pressing against my own. Then she appeared to age before my eyes. Her skin felt youthful and firm as it made contact with mine. You will need it, for your journey will be filled with many hardships. Your courage and conviction will be tested through your travels, throughout your travels. You must accept it and use it. I opened my hand to look at it, wondering. Before I could ask, she said, an ear pendant. I held it up to the light where the gold glittered in the morning sun. As I twirled it between my fingers, at the base of the ear pendant, a serpent's fang held a small loop. 
With the loop, five white rings were suspended, each one larger than the last, nesting snugly inside each other like the rings of Saturn. It is a likeness of Chihuatil, La Serpiente, La Llorona explained, watching it glint in the morning sun. Along the bank, we were almost fully exposed to the sun, though the thick woods continued to stretch for miles around us. A most powerful amulet. It was given to me by my mother on my 15th birthday by the altar of Tenochtitlan when I became a woman. It has magical properties, gifts from the gods, but you can only use it five times, once for every ring on its axis. I examined the beautiful pendant. It had to be centuries old if she was telling the truth. Take it, she said, when I tried handing it back. How could I take something so valuable? Even half a pair must be worth a fortune. It belongs to you now. Wear it on your left ear. When you need help, take hold of it, spin it, and invoke the goddess, the Aztec queen, Tonatzin, the holy mother of all mankind, and ask for her magical assistance. Whatever you ask, she will provide. I, I can't do this, I told La Llorona. How can I take responsibility for something so powerful? It frightened, it frightened me more than La Llorona herself to do such a thing. This ear pendant can do many things, La Llorona insisted. It can change your aura and provide you with a safe passage as you travel from your world into ours. But be careful to use it wisely. Never call upon its power in anger or arrogance. You and your sisters must remain pure of heart on this journey. Odilia, be courageous, but remember also to be noble and kind. If you do that, everything will be all right. Odilia, is that you? Juanita's voice startled La Llorona, who stepped back into the brush. They're just little girls dreaming up an adventure. I can't drag them down to Mexico. I can't sacrifice them to follow my path. I whispered fiercely, still holding the air pendant in front of me. But La Llorona wasn't taking it back. I heard twigs breaking and footsteps getting closer from the direction of the swimming hole. The girls couldn't see us from the path. We were hidden behind a heavy cluster of Huisachi trees. But if they veered off the path, they'd find me talking to a phantom. This is not for this is not for you to do alone, La Llorona said. You must come together, you and your hermanitas. You must rejoice in the strength of sisterhood and return the man to his family. Because we're lost, I asked. Even as I said it, a pang of recognition that La Llorona was exactly right about us, that we were lost, flustered to life within me, much like the mariposas who were beginning to stir in the morning light. At the same time, La Llorona confirming Juanita's crazy plan made me question my own sanity. But what if she was right? If doing something as simple as returning a dead man to his family would save our family, shouldn't I try? Yet the thought of going to Mexico without telling Mama where we were going or why made me feel awful. We hadn't even left her a note. What would she think? What would she feel? Aban would she feel abandoned again? Delia and Velia were arguing with each other in the brush behind us. They weren't more than 10 feet away, but the clusters of Huisacha's trees sheltered us from their view. She, le she left, Delia declared. No, she wouldn't do that. She wouldn't leave us out here all alone, Velia said, their voices getting closer and closer until I knew they were only a few yards away. I focused back on the spectral woman, whose voice was becoming more strained. It is the only way, La Llorona whispered. Your mother and sisters need you. They are lost in despair. They needed me right here, taking care of them. Mama was depending on me to keep them safe. I'm tired of your riddles. I'm taking them home, I said, turning to go. Please, La Llorona pleaded, standing up and stepping in front of me. You must take him back. Don't do it for him. He's just a man who committed a selfish act. Don't do it for his wife either. She cries for him for her own selfish reasons. Don't even do it for his little ones who, like many children, have already turned to their play without thinking much of him anymore. Do it for your hermanitas. Deliver the man home to his family and then drive your sisters to a sacrificio to see their abuela. Reunite your family, Odalia. Odilia. It is all part of the journey you must take, the path to true happiness. Odilia, who are you talking to? Juanita burst through the brush from another direction. I thought she was with the twins behind her, Huisaches. She stopped abruptly and started and stared at me. And why are your clothes all wet? She asked. I looked around for La Llorona, but the apparition was gone. 
Nobody, I said, suddenly feeling stupid. I'm losing it, I thought. As I pushed branches aside, fighting my way back to the clearing. But I heard voices, Juanita insisted. I took the ear pendant back into my pocket for safekeeping. Me too. I think it's Delia and Velia arguing again. No, Juanita said. I heard them. But I heard you too. You were talking to someone out here. I wasn't. That was one thing I hated about Juanita. The way she clung to things and wouldn't let them go. Like a dim-witted gnat stuck on a piece of rotten fruit. Rotting fruit. I couldn't explain to her who I'd been talking to, but she wouldn't let it go. Yes, you were. I heard you, she insisted. Why are you lying to me? Okay, fine. I finally admit it. I was talking to La Llorona. She wants us to take the drowned man home. I tried telling her we couldn't, but she said we have to do it because it's our destiny or something. I couldn't understand her. She talks in riddles. There, I admit it. I was talking to a ghost. Are you happy now? Fine, don't tell me. I don't care. I don't have to know. Juanita clamped her mouth shut and stalked off. I followed her close behind without saying another word. If I'd known the truth was one thing that could shut Juanita up for good, I would have stopped lying to her years ago.